Today, A Christian and Art. Continued. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. So we began this discussion, uh, again, prompted by some Wednesday nights I've been doing at my own church, uh, and uh, just talking about how Christians interact with art, because in a lot of experience I have, uh, we're not necessarily the best at understanding what's going on with art. Not, you know, it's not nothing particular about Christians. A lot of people don't really know what's going on when they're encountering art, and none of us will ever grasp it fully. That's part of the beauty or wonder of art to begin with. But there are ways we can do a better job of understanding what's happening to us and what's happening with artists when they're producing the art and understanding what God can do with it. Uh, if we will just make ourselves available to whatever it is he's accomplishing through these kinds of works, uh, artistic works. So when we were talking about it before, uh, I mentioned uh, in the nature of art, the expressive, relatable, subtle nature of art and why it's subtle and all of that, you can listen to it in the first episode about art that we did last, A Christian and Art. And then uh, we talked about the importance of art because it addresses human nature and shared experience. And we paused under shared experience and to, 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 you know, because we ran out of time uh, to come back today uh, and be able to pick it up with what happens when we encounter a piece of art uh, in ourselves. So what I wanted to bring our attention to was why you can have two different people stand in front of a work of art and see it completely differently. Uh, somebody relate to it because it reminds them of their grandmother and someone else because it reminds them of when they tripped when they were playing soccer or whatever. And yet both have really sincere experiences uh, of beauty, uh, moving experiences, for instance, in front of that work of art. Again, think of people who go to watch a movie uh, and they find themselves crying and they don't even know why. And then when they're talking about it, they have completely different reasons for why they responded the way they did. There is a reason that happens, and it doesn't mean that we have to just give away any value in the art itself and say, well, I guess people just make of it whatever they want. That wouldn't give any value at all to the art. As I mentioned before at the end of the last episode, it's sort of like saying, well, you can just stand in front of a wall and see whatever you want to see. That's not what a painting is. There's something in the painting. There's something in the poem. There's something in the movie that brings about this response. And yet somehow or another, the response is personalized because of what it does to you, what it means to you, which is distinct from what it might mean or do to someone else. So how can that be? How can you have this interaction with art where there is objective value and content to the work of art itself, but then also have that experience different for every person, meaning there's something subjective going on. So where the objective and the subjective come together, the objective part being what's outside of you personally, so in the art itself, and then the subjective part, the part that's in you, the subject, the person who's experiencing it, the place where those things intersect is a part of what philosophers have talked about forever. I know you think I'm just tricking you into having to listen to a bunch of philosophy, but I really do want to talk about the art, but I just don't think it makes as much sense as it needs to if we don't understand what's going on at the intersection of the subjective and objective in people. But, and, I, and I'm not saying this completely blindly either. Uh, for decades, I've experienced people uh, just 
just dismissing out of hand things that might be different because they are experienced subjectively. Oh, it's just yeah, that's just subjective relativism, and there's no value in that at all. But there are complex relationships between the subjective and the ele- and the objective that are inherently important to us. And so I want to make sure we grasp that. So briefly, a, a, a philosophical excursion, just, just briefly. I know, promises, promises, you say. But I mean for it to be brief. So here's, here's what I would say. And this is basically taking a John Locke and, um, and a uh, George Barclay uh, approach to understanding, so an empirical approach to understanding what's going on in us and what's going on in the world outside of us. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through all the elements of idealism or anything like that. And we're not going all the way into idealism. We're going to talk about it the way sort of a person like John Locke might talk about it. And it's in simple, uh, simple categories. Number one, there are primary attributes in a thing. This is what we would think of as a purely objective elements. So the primary attributes of a thing are basically extension. Extension means it takes up space. It's in a certain place, that kind of stuff, right? So a thing has density and mass and so on. All of those basic things that would be present in the object just because it's an object. Those are referred to as primary attributes. So if you take a primary attribute or quality, then you would say it has size, it has location. Uh, You might even say it has weight or momentum or things like that. Okay, that's fine. Those are just in the object. Person can experience it, not experience it, doesn't make any difference. Those things don't change. It's still the size that it is, whatever size it is. That's primary. Then there are secondary attributes. This is completely different. A secondary attribute is something instead of where instead of saying, well, this this is uh, you know this has a certain texture to it. Instead of that, you I mean, instead of saying it has a certain density to it, you would say it also is red. It has a color to it. But the color, while it's caused by something in the object itself, it's caused by whatever reflectivity it has of certain radiations under certain exposures and conditions, whatever. All of those things that are true about the object itself, none of those are red. What's red is your experience in the presence of the object. You see redness in the object. And I wish I could, you know, like if you were here in the room, I would be pointing out how you could see this. I'll describe it the best I can. But if I, if I'm, if you look at a ball over in the corner and it, and you see it as red, the fact that you would think the redness is in the ball itself makes sense because something in that ball is making you see the redness right in the ball. But it's not in the ball because if it was, the redness would also be everywhere between the ball and you. So you could reach out and grab a handful of redness halfway between the ball and yourself. But there's no redness between the ball and yourself. You, anybody looking at it from anywhere else in the room would see that there's just clear air between you and the ball. Even if you got into your eye and you tried to look at your retina, you wouldn't see redness on your retina. You, you would see these uh, cones and rods interacting with the stimulation that's coming from that particular form of radiation. And then if you could climb into your optic nerve, you wouldn't find a stream of red like, oh, he's leaking blood. No, that's just the redness of the ball. You wouldn't see that. You would just see electrical impulses, these little signals going down your optic nerve. Okay, I'm taking too long. The point is... There's no redness until it gets to your mind. It's not even in your brain. You cut open your brain, the redness you find would be your blood. It wouldn't be the redness from the ball. The the redness isn't anywhere except in your mind, but it was caused by something in the ball. If you paint the ball, I don't need to paint your mind to get the ball to look a different color. I paint the ball to get it to look a different color. And it does because there is an attribute in the ball that makes it red, but it is a secondary attribute of the ball. It requires something from you. And in the category of secondary attributes or qualities, we we talk about color and texture where you don't just say it's there. You say, oh, it's smooth or it's rough. You don't just 
taste something and say, oh, it has some kind of density to it, you say it's sweet or it's savory or it's whatever. It has an aroma or it has a certain tone to sound. Those are secondary attributes. They're experienced in the subject, but it's because of what's in the object. So you get the idea of what I mean by secondary. Primary attributes are in the object itself. They're just flat in the object, size and shape and stuff like that. Secondary attributes are experienced in the subject, me, but they're but 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 I experience what I do because of what's in the object. So it's both objective and subjective. But there's another thing, another layer, third tertiary attribute that exists that's even more dominated by what's going on in the subject, even though it's still caused by the object. And this has to do with what we're talking about. If I love the nature of balls and I love to play basketball and baseball and, you know, all the things that have balls. And so I see a ball and I now suddenly have a very positive, friendly reaction to it. That value that I give to the ball is even further removed from what's in the ball itself. It's not about density and shape and size very much, but it is some, but it's not as directly related to the ball as the color or shape of the ball or texture, I mean, of the ball is. But it's still because it's a ball that I think to myself, oh, not only is it a red ball over in the corner, it's so beautiful. I love red balls. The whole idea of saying all of that is that when I bring to it a certain kind of value, I'm bringing a third level of attribute to that object. But it's still about the object. It's still being caused by the object, but it's being caused by the object with a really heavy-handed influence of what's going on in me. Okay, I'm, I'm done. The philosophical part's done. You, you can rejoin the podcast at this point. The point is that it's both objective and subjective, and both are critical to the experience that I'm having about that object, whatever it is. So you can see how important that becomes with a piece of art, because when I'm looking at the Mona Lisa or a uh, representation of the Mona Lisa, I'm not just experiencing a set of, uh, you know, radioactive, I mean, radiation, you know, of, of light waves coming off of a piece of paper that takes up a certain amount of space paper. I don't know what it's painted on. The point is, I'm not just experiencing the stuff that's purely objective. I'm seeing colors, but I'm not just seeing colors and shapes. I'm seeing something that makes me think to myself, wow, that is, that's an amazing, that's an amazing piece of art. That's, that thing is beautiful. That part is tertiary, but it's still dependent on the object. It's being caused by the values I have and the way I see things, and yet it's being caused to bring about that way of seeing things and valuing things because of what's in the object itself. Okay, so as I start to come to art, I get why it's important that I'm in the presence of something that's provoking this experience of beauty in me. I know how to interact. I know, you know, that I am interacting with it like that. What I don't always understand is why I value certain things so much that they provoke these responses in me. You've, you've been there before, right? Where you're sitting in a movie theater and something happens and you're, you're tearing up. And you're trying to cover it up so nobody can see it because it's absurd. It's like, why, why am I crying right now? I'm not crying. I'm not crying. You're crying. The, whatever it is, you're just saying, it's like, what's happening to me? There's a reason that certain things provoke a response in us that's more universal. And, uh, and, and when I say that, I, you know, nothing's universal. Everybody responds differently to things. But, you know, the more shared experiences are, the more we say they are universal. And there are certain experiences that are so common uh, that we do refer to them as universal. And these are from sociologists in the early 20th century and 
They're fantastic, and I've talked about them before, so I won't take very long on them, but I do want to attach them to Christianity in particular so you can see why we have, as believers, as as people who, who follow Jesus or are just familiar with how to follow Jesus, why we respond so strongly to certain parts of the story of Jesus' life and why they are so poignantly focused on in the Gospels. And so uh, this the, the nature of this shared experience that I'm about to describe for you is it's called liminality. Uh, li, you know, a limina, a limina is a threshold. It's a limit, right? So when you come to a door, the threshold you stepped over, step over, that's the word. The Latin word limina is the, is the word for that threshold. And so this, this point of crossing over or changing is particularly important to us as human beings. It's only natural, uh, because, you know, we're experiencing every moment we're breathing and nobody pays attention to every breath. Even if you try, eventually you get bored, you know, that's 10,448. <sighs> yeah, you just can't, you can't pay attention to every breath. You do notice the things that change. And when change happens, you're stepping over a threshold. And so that's why liminality becomes so important. And we talked about this again. I, I'm not, so I won't go through all the details, but there are seven most important thresholds that have been recognized for the last 125 years or so. And in that recognition, you know, we've come to, to grasp that when these things happen in a person's life or in a story, we're all going to pay closer attention. We can't ignore it. It's almost like you can't look away, like a, you know, a train wreck or something. But it, you know, sometimes it's not negative, but it's like that. You just can't look away. There's something changing here. And so the elements are, if you take them in terms of the, you know, the normal human life, the way people experience life, and again, you can see why these are undeniably universal. There's birth. I mean, you know, when, the, when, when people are born, it's fairly important to all of us. Okay, so I won't comment on all of them. But birth, coming of age, you know, puberty. Vocation, meaning you figure out what you're going to do with your life. You get a job or something, and the something is you get married. That's the other option. And normally, vocation and marriage are made one choice or the other. Now, I don't mean that like nobody who gets married has a job. I don't mean that. But I mean the sense of calling that people have, vocation, hence the word vocation, the sense of calling that people have is distinct from the idea of getting married. And so normally, uh, the way we imagine this, the way we tell stories about it, and the way it's lived out in some contexts, think of the priesthood, for instance, you have to choose. Are you going to accept your calling or are you going to get married? And if you get married, you still have to make money. You still have to go get a job. You have to do something. But it may not be your calling, right? So superheroes, they don't get to get married. And if they do, something goes wrong. They are pursuing their calling. They have to fulfill their purpose. Okay, so anyway, I'm taking too long. The point is birth, coming of age, which is puberty, vocation, your sense of calling, the direction you're supposed to take your life's purpose, marriage, and then death. Right after marriage, there's just death. There's no in-between. So that's fairly discouraging, isn't it? But anyway, so you got birth, coming of age, vocation, marriage, and then death. Each of those critical transitional points in our existence, and they're all, you can tell, diachronic. They all happen uh, in a succession of time, right? So you're born, you go through puberty, you have to make a decision about your calling in life and then marriage, and then, uh, you know, eventually you run out of life and you die. Okay, so you're at the end. There are two others, those are five, those are the five key liminalities that, that go in the order of our lives' time. And then there are two others. One is stranger in a strange land. These are persistent, you know, throughout our lives. They could be at any moment. So stranger in a strange land, we just, we end up being in the wrong place uh, or in a different place. So when we're traveling, we're a stranger in a strange land. Uh, there's all, they're always, they, you, I mean, you can imagine the number of stories that are built around a stranger in a strange land. The other one is be, I, I refer to it as being out of joint. I don't even know what the best word for this particular liminality is, but I refer to it as being out of joint, meaning things are not right. So historically, we would have seen that as sin, uh, you've done something wrong, or disease, so you are sick. So something's wrong, and it's got to be made right. 
Now, the easy way to grasp these seven liminalities, and this is how I talked about it in a previous episode, the easy way to grasp it is just to compare it with the uh, seven sacraments. You know, that's what it goes with most easily. But I'm going to skip that for today. You can go back and listen to another episode and figure that out. But instead of the seven limit, uh, the seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, because it's not about the Catholic Church, the, the Catholic Church has had the seven sacraments since before we ever thought about what the liminalities were. The point is our experience drives us to need to address all of these, these experiences in life. Those five moments of life transition, birth, coming of age, vocation, marriage, and death, and then those two things where something's in the wrong place in our life right now. A uh, stranger in a strange land, hey, I'm not home. You know, where, where am I? What's going on here? Or being out of joint, ah, what's, this is broken. You know, something's not working right. I'm not able to breathe. Something's gone wrong. So in all of those, we need to address them. And so they turn into the seven sacraments. In the same, oh, I, I, and I don't mean that by that. We figured out these liminalities, then we had to make it religious. I mean the seven sacraments conform to it because, you know, you need to sanctify the major events in your life. And so this is what you do. And this is, by the way, when we use the word liminal very often, it's a direct reference to whoever is going through a religious ceremony in a society, in a given society in the world. So, okay, that all said, what I find most fascinating about it is where these liminalities turn up in the Christian story. So if we're looking at the life of Christ, if we're looking at the Christ event, and we say, all right, well, where's the focus on this particular aspect of liminality? The elements are obvious. So, so if we start at the beginning, birth, I mean, this, this is the most obvious one. It's the, you know, the, the sacred time of the year, the greatest story ever told. It's the nativity. Uh, and so the nativity is the birth of Jesus. The birth is the critical element. The second one, puberty, uh, coming of age, where is that in the in the uh, Christian story? It's Jesus returning to Jerusalem, right? He's lost in Jerusalem. His parents are seeking for him. He's coming of age. What's he doing? He's in his father's house, doing his father's business. His own parents are being confronted by the fact that he is his own person now. And even in his submission to them and his return, with them to their home is a part of our acknowledging that he is his own man now and he's choosing now submission to his earthly parents, right? So coming of age in the lost in Jerusalem story, the vocation that he has, I mean, he's being set apart for his calling in the temptation, the 40 days in the wilderness with Satan offering the three temptations and Jesus choosing to remain faithful to his calling, not just looking for the bread of this world and so on, but instead accepting his calling and the role that he's going to fulfill. By the way, even marriage, the liminality of marriage shows up in the life of Jesus in the nature of the first miracle. He's at a wedding. And he's very explicitly not the groom, but he's in the wedding making it everything it's supposed to be. He's the one who's bringing the blessing to the wedding because he's the one converting the water into wine. You can have that discussion with yourself if you want to figure it out. All right, so birth, coming of age, vocation, marriage, death, no brainer. The crucifixion itself is him being taken to the threshold and across into death, and then stepping back across through the resurrection, obviously. The stranger in a strange land uh, liminality in Christ's life is also also worth mentioning here, and it's uh, one of the most prominent ones. I mean, the, ob the obvious one is just Christ's life on earth, the incarnation itself. He is a stranger in a strange land. He came unto his own, in John's words, and his own received him not. They did not know him. This is, the, this is the whole point of a stranger in a strange land. So you just take the incarnation as a whole and say, ah, that's the, that's the stranger in a strange land in the life of Jesus. But it, it is so obvious what it is. It's so important what it is in Christ's life that we also have it in Matthew 2, for instance, and references, and Matthew 2 is the story of Jesus going down into Egypt because Herod is seeking his life, if you, if you don't remember the story. So right after the birth of Jesus, remember Herod's trying to figure out where the Messiah is going to be born, and I want to know, and tell me, and the wise men come, and all that. 
in that story, he goes down into Egypt, and it even refers to the book of Hosea. To, you know, so it says, I, this, this, is my, this is my son, and, I, and he's going down to Egypt. And people look at it, and they go, well, that, 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 in Hosea, it's obviously about Israel, the nation of Israel. So why is it saying in Matthew 2 that it's about Jesus? Because Jesus is fulfilling what Israel is throughout all of history, which is a stranger in a strange land. There are people who are looking for their home, and they're finding their home in someone else's place. They find it wandering with Abraham in the wilderness. They find, and, and by the way, Abraham, even when he comes to Canaan, ends up going down to Egypt in the same way because he is always, and this is what Hebrews 11 tells us, a stranger in a strange land. He's the father of Israel. So for Jesus to be Israel in this world, he has to become a stranger in a strange land, and he also goes down to Egypt and lives there until they finally return, and he's raised in Nazareth. Even when he's in Nazareth, obviously, as the incarnation of God on earth, he is a stranger in a strange land. Okay, so you get the idea of the of those six parts of the liminality in Christ's life. What about the seventh, being out of joint? Normally, we would say this is being in sin or being diseased. So, you know, if you read stories from the Middle Ages or from the early Enlightenment period, it would be stories about sin. Someone has committed some kind of sin and it needs to be rectified. They need to find some resolution to it and so on. If you were reading stories from our day, it's going to be a story about someone who's discovered they have cancer or dementia or something else. They are out of joint, and it needs to be made right. Something has to happen to fix this problem. So what would that be in Jesus? You know, we look at him, and it's like, well, he doesn't. I mean, this is from the period where you would need it to be sin. You know, what's wrong with this person? They sin, but we can't think about Jesus sinning. But the whole point of the story of the moment in the garden, and by the way, there are plenty of other points before this that uh, that emphasize it as well, but the garden makes it really obvious. When Jesus comes to the garden, his point of pleading with his father is to say, I should not be, this is not right. Take this away from me. Take this cup away from me. What is that cup that he has? It is the point that he, ever since Matthew 8 describes it, Ever since he began healing and touching those who were infirmed, he has not just dismissed their infirmity, he hasn't just waved it away, he has, in the words of Matthew 8, 17, taken it on himself. He has carried our infirmity. And so he is, out, He is. things are wrong with him. Things are wrong because he is covered with our guilt and our sin. And so he's out of, that's why he's in the garden and saying, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And he follows his father's will, carries our sins, bearing our burdens, being out of joint in that way. Okay, so all of that, I mean, that that's a, those are all elements that are a beautiful part not only of what makes Christ's life glorious, distinctly uh, worshipful, but also relevant to us. It's part of the nature of the incarnation. He went through all the liminalities we go through. We have a shared experience with him. We had a birth. We had a time when we were figuring out that we were a person separate from our parents. We had a decision to make about whether we were going to yield to our calling, pursue what God wanted us to do in our lives. We had a moment of figuring out whether to compromise that calling with marriage or in marriage to find the fulfillment of giving someone else life in a different way, whatever it is. We had the reality that we are being pursued by death. In our lives, we all experience that, and we read about every one of those in the life of Christ and what's going on with him. And we all know what it is to feel out of place, to you know, not know where the classroom is, where we're supposed to you know, take our next college class or in elementary school. What room am I supposed to be in? Who's my teacher? All the panic of being a stranger in a strange land. And we all know what it is to have told the lie or to have hidden or whatever it is that put us out of joint and made things wrong and that we hoped somehow 
would be rectified, would be made right in the end. All of those things give us a reason, not only for identifying the need for Christ, just as Savior, period, straight up, no beauty has to be involved. The need is objective, but also for giving us an understanding, a, a confrontation with beauty in the way Christ fulfills what we ourselves have been experiencing, and yet, fulfills it perfectly. Uh, There is a beauty in that, in the art of the Gospels, in the art of the actual life of Christ that we also experience. So liminality helps us. I'm pointing out liminality for this reason. This whole section is, is, is for us to understand that part of what makes art valuable is that it connects with us because we have shared experiences as human beings with every other human being, just by being human. It's our nature as beings. Now, obviously, we have more strongly shared experiences with people who are closer to us, people who have a lot of the same cultural influences or the same familial influences, the same linguistic influences, whatever. Those can help. But a lot of them are simply because we are humans experiencing the same kind of life, whether we want to or not. Okay. Part of shared experience is that liminality. Part of it is in the reason artists use the the thing I think is central to what makes art art, by the way, which is metaphor. Uh, Metaphor is, you know, comparing one thing with another. You're speaking of one thing uh, on the side being next to or parallel with something else. So a simile is a kind of metaphor. I know the difference between simile and metaphor in literary terms, but in broader cultural linguistic terms and the nature of things, philosophical terms, metaphor is the overarching term. And then you have similes and all kinds of tropes and references and images and so on uh, that are all different variations of these analogous uh, analogies or these comparisons that are metaphors. And so artists use metaphors because they allow one type of shared experience that you can identify with. Ooh, look at that wheat field or look at that wind blowing or, you know, look at this marriage or whatever it is that's going on that you can identify with. It allows you to talk about something or paint something, show something, illustrate something that you can see. It allows you with that to create a connection to something you might not have realized you had in common with an artist or with the experience of some other people. So metaphor creates this shared experience. What Jesus is doing with every parable, right? Every parable is a little piece of art. And Jesus is holding up this image and saying, well, you know how how wheat works. You know how seed goes in the ground, and you know how it produces fruit. And so you ought to be able to understand what's going on inside of you when God is putting his word down in the ground. You know, what's gone wrong? If it's not producing fruit, something's gone wrong because the nature of that word is that it's going to produce fruit. The imagery does more than just make a mathematical connection where you can figure out what the derived truth was. It also creates this familiarity and sense of shared experience that opens you up to grasp at a deeper level the reality of what's going on in an, in an invisible world that you weren't paying attention to before. Motifs do that. Motifs, this these constantly repeated themes that show up in an individual work of art or through a series of works. As motifs show up, you become more and more aware of something you have in common with the artist or with the work of art itself. And so it, you know, it gives us an ability to grasp what we otherwise would have ignored. Uh, irony is a part of our shared experience in art. Irony meaning we expect one thing, that's because we share the experience of a thing. So we expect something to be a certain of a certain nature. And so when a, you know, when a person is isolated, they're out in the desert and they're completely, you know, completely separated from everyone else, everywhere else. And yet they're having a jolly good time and having a conversation with themselves as if they're surrounded by a million people. There's tension between the experience that person is having 
and the experience we would expect them to have out in the middle of a desert, right? So that's irony. Irony is tension between what you actually do have present and what you would have expected to be present in something. It can be irony between the way a thing is written and the thing that's actually said in what's written. It can be irony between the nature of a tune and the nature of the lyrics that are sung to that tune. It can be any kind of tension that exists between, again, what you would expect in this context, what you would expect in that setting, and what you actually receive in that setting, irony sets us up to receive something we might have ignored otherwise. And finally, when we're looking outside of the self, I'm, I'm looking outside of myself at something to seek beauty, to seek some value of some kind. So let's go to a museum and let's see some art. Let's go to a movie and see something funny. Let's, you know, whatever it is, I'm trying to take something in from outside to have an influence on me. Here's the thing I'm doing. I'm looking outside of myself for an expression from an artist. So do something over there that'll have an influence on me, that will have an impact on me. So I want the art or the object that I'm looking at to shape my experience. But that doesn't mean that it owns my experience. There's still room for your take or my take on a piece of art, whatever the object is, to be completely different than someone else's take on that piece of art. You know, I listen to this piece of, I listen to this song and it, it just, it makes me happy. I don't know. It gives me some, some kind of ebullience. Oh, well, it makes me forlorn. I'm listening to it, and I'm just thinking, "Oh my soul, I'm I'm so I'm almost disturbed by listening to this piece of music." And I and I there are some pieces of music that I know that are like that, where people respond completely the opposite way emotionally to the piece of art. And I know that we're thinking to ourselves, "Well, then, what difference does the art make?" I mean, people are just going to experience whatever they experience, but that's not the case. In the same, I, you know, I, it's hard to make the point strongly enough, but, uh, you know, I'll try a metaphor. I'll try a comparison to see if I can illustrate. You know, if you have a wave that's coming in from the ocean, it's a fairly objective piece of matter, right? I mean, it's just a wave. It's a bunch of water that's coming at you. So the, 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 a wave can hit you in the face. I've had it do this to me before. It can hit you in the face and cause you to choke, right? I mean, it goes down your throat and you didn't want it in your throat and you don't know what little creatures are in there and you're spitting and gagging and, you know, all the reaction that you get. And it's not a pleasant experience. You're just trying to clear your head out after that happens to you. The same, very same wave can do nothing but boy, yeah, B-O-U-Y, I don't know how, B-U-O-Y, let's get that right. Boy, boy, your friend you know, it chokes you, it buoys your friend, it's the same wave. And yet you didn't choke all in yourself. It was a wave that choked you. And your friend doesn't just float all on their own. It's a wave that gives them buoyancy. Yeah, there, I can do it with buoyancy, that word. Okay, so you get the point. Art does the same thing. The same wave hits us and we can respond to it in completely different ways. And yeah, sometimes it might be incompetence that's governing our way of experiencing. It doesn't matter because that's part of who we are also. We know some things and we don't know some things, and that's part of what shapes our response to art. So my point is we can have these experiences where an artist expresses something meaningful, potent, objective, valuable and yet have different experiences in the presence of it, not completely dictated by the artist, but certainly shaped by whatever the artist produced. That's what art does. It's the nature of art. You don't have to give up objective content just because you acknowledge how important your personalized experience of that art is. It's not necessary. And in fact, it's really important if we're going to grasp the, the underlying value of art, that we acknowledge that. And, and, here, and here's part of the reason why. And this is really what I wanted to get to, and we'll try to finish with this today. When, uh, and I, I'm going to refer, I, I refer to it as being vulnerable, you know, vulnerable moments. 
So vulnerable moments come in the presence of art, moments where you can be transformed, where you can be changed. Because a lot of times we're just so fixed, and, and fixity is a problem in human beings because none of us are perfect. But we're just so fixed that we're not going to change no matter what's going on. Well, I don't like stuff like that. Okay, I, there are a lot of things I don't like either, but I need to learn to like some things that I don't. Admittedly, there are some things I probably don't need to learn to like. But the point is, I'm not perfect. I need to be, I, I need things to provoke me to change. One of the things that can do that is art. And it can do it in a particularly powerful way because it can make us particularly vulnerable. So why do we become vulnerable? Well, one of the key reasons I think is easy, most easily expressed uh, in the language of S.T. Coleridge, you know, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So 19th century artist, poet, uh, philosopher, thinker, essayist, uh, really, really excellent. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the Romantics, but I, but I am a big fan of, of Coleridge's thinking. Anyway, one of the things he gives us is this phrase that a lot of us have used in other contexts, the willing suspension of disbelief. Uh, and the willing suspension of disbelief is the thing that you bring to a movie theater that allows you to believe that people are flying around between planets, you know, in Star Wars or Star Trek or something. Uh, it allows you to think of things happening that wouldn't make sense otherwise. It's why you think Superman can fly and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm willing to suspend the nature of my skepticism for the creative room that an author, uh, an artist, a producer has in creating this certain scenario that he wants me to experience. So I'm willing to do that. So to, 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 to me, that can take a lot of different forms. To the consumer, I'm not an artist. I'm a person who consumes art. I see art. I experience art. So I'm a, I, that's what I mean by the consumer. To you, to me, there are a lot of different elements uh, in which we can be made vulnerable partially because we're willing to put aside our skepticism and our judgment of things for a moment to see what's going to be done with this. You know, what's going to happen with this flying caped man? You know, what's, gonna, what's going on with this? And so one of the ways that happens is through humor. Uh, we experience humor, and, and and humor, you know, disarms us. It's light. It's it's not what we expected. It's fluffy, and so we think, well, you know, that's why we laugh it off. It's no big deal. And what humor does is disarm us to a point where an artist can reach in and say something we wouldn't have been willing to 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 let him say if we weren't laughing when he started saying it. But we were laughing, and so our heart was a little bit more open uh, to the idea. This is why you hear. And my experience of these things is a lot in the only form of something slightly artistic that I participate in, uh, in rhetoric, you know, in, in preaching or speaking. Uh, and I know it's true that uh, the more lighthearted you can get the congregation in a certain moment, the more likely you are to be successful at slipping in something they might not have wanted to hear but that they really needed to understand. And that, you know, the humor opening, sort of cracking open the door uh, is an avenue to that. And so us experiencing that, it's not, it's not a bad thing to experience. It is something to be aware of. Ah, yeah, this is, this is light. Maybe, maybe there's something serious I need to learn here. And you've seen that in a lot of different cases, I'm sure. Second, liminality. Liminality does it because liminality you know, makes us vulnerable sort of inherently by opening up those psychological moments in our life that were most important to us. When your child was born or when you went through puberty or when you got married or when you finally got that job or had that great success that you'd always been waiting on or when you lost your parent to death or whatever it was, that moment of vulnerability allows an artist to, artist, pierce through the shell we normally have up that says, no, I'm just having a normal day today. You're not going to break me down. I'm going to be everything that I was yesterday, tomorrow. You're not going to change this. And then finally, these other elements of aesthetics. And, I, you know, I could take these from all kinds of categories, Aristotle's elements of drama or whatever. But it's all these elements that fit the aesthetic context. You know, when you're in the presence of a piece of art, they can serve the same function. Uh, it's almost like distraction, you know, like somebody waving their hand over here 
and then taking something from you with the other hand. Spectacle, you know, the big, blustery, obvious things that are going on, fireworks, whatever it is. Song, because music has such a profound distinction in it from the everyday mundane world that we normally encounter. I won't express all of these in detail, but order, just the orderliness that can be brought, you know, in dance, for instance, certain kinds of dance, for instance, or frenetic disorder, by the way, in certain other kinds of dance. The, the, the chaos that can be uh, Ill- illustrated in, you know, action on stage or whatever's going on or in a painting, an expressionist painting. Uh, color, uh, the dramatic colors that can be contrasted. This is part of why I love Marc Chagall. Setting, uh, just a weird setting, you know, Tatooine, some foreign planet. Seems like I've heard that name in Star Wars. Uh, character, uh, a character that is just so, oh, I mean, we use the word colorful, a colorful character. That kind of character, all of those things can be used exactly the same way to open you up, sort of wedge you open so that you can receive something you wouldn't have received before. I'd love to give a short illustration here, but I think it would take probably more time than I want to take. But it, but it, but it is to make this point, that when we hear someone say, an artist, say something offensive, uh, I will give you this one, Robert Frost. Love this aphorism because it's so terrible when he says to God, forgive, O Lord, my little jokes on thee, and I'll forgive thy great big joke on me. The level, you know, the, the first, the irony that's built into that, I would love to talk about it in detail, I won't. The irony that's built into it, the limericky sort of sound, sing-songy nature and sort of silly little aphoristic sound to it, combined with the bitterness, the cynicism of a life that would question, that would confront God in this way with the bitterness of his own life's experience you know, that's profound irony. So it's a, it's a brilliant piece of art. And I think sometimes we look at something like that and we, and we say, oh, this is just some guy griping at God. And we dismiss it out of hand, losing our opportunity to learn something, not just learn something in our head, but to experience something that's part of the reality of what God wants us to have experienced in humanity among other humans and in his presence. Art isn't art, and I'm about to close, so just hear this out and I'll be done. Art is not art because it's Christian, but because it's human. Artists are valuable, not because they are Christian, but because they are human. The questions we have to ask about the quality of their art is whether they are expressive, intentional, relatable, provocative. And I mean by that in the sense of provoking us or provoking others to consider what we formerly denied or ignored. And we do that all the time. And I think being vulnerable to that kind of art can put us in a position where we're a little more vulnerable to the art that God wants to make in our lives to the change he wants to make in who we are. That's what I hope art will do for us as believers. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.